Hey, my name is Dave Blake. Welcome to Harbor Covenant. glad that you're here worshiping with us, coming together just to worship something bigger than ourselves. In fact, to put ourselves the least, to put him the highest. So I want you to hear these words from Psalm 148. It says this, Hallelujah! 
Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights above. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His heavenly hosts. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you shining stars. Praise Him, you highest heavens and you waters above the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for at His command they were created, and He established them forever and ever. He issued a decree that will never pass away. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. I'm going to sing in the middle of the storm. Louder. Inside of me, with everything inside of me, I raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. And I will watch the darkness flee. And I will watch the darkness flee. I raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. In the middle of the mystery. Hold on. No. 
I love these words that start the book of Hebrews. And hear these words and what they say about Jesus. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being sustaining all things by his powerful word. And after he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. And this song is our song of the week. You were the word at the beginning One with God Covenant Church, please join me in prayer. Let's begin with worship and thanks. Jesus, you said, I am the light of the world, and we worship you 
because you are our greatest light. You are the one that brings illumination to dark places. You are our present and our forever hope. And we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We remember today the gifts of salvation, of your indwelling spirit, of your word, and of your people. You have truly rich, richly blessed us beyond measure. Join me now in a time of confession. We humbly come before you and confess our constant need. Forgive us for the ways that we have wandered from you. We have placed our trust in things and in people and ideas rather than in you, our great and mighty God. Join me now in praying for the needs of our church, our community, and our nation. We pray today for our church body, and as we move into a season of Advent, of waiting on Jesus, Lord, we ask that you would help us to live in joyful expectation. We pray for our church. We ask that you would give us unity as we live in uncertain and contentious times. Help us to love and to listen to each other. We pray for our community as many struggle right now. Jesus, we ask that you would fill us with your perfect light. Help us to know how to reflect your light to those that are really struggling right now. And we ask that you would show us both little and big ways that we can extend the love and the light of Jesus to those around us. And we pray for our nation. We pray for our elected officials, that they would work together with wisdom on behalf of the common good. We pray that we the people would learn to listen to those that are different than ourselves. We pray for just systems in our government. And we pray that you would rise up bridge builders to unify our polarized nation. And finally, we thank you for the incredible progress that we've seen in advancing vaccines and treatment for COVID. And we continue to pray for your strength and your protection for our most vulnerable, as well as for our medical community. Join me now in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Have you ever needed some help? Um, I don't like to do plumbing projects. In fact, when my kids were young and I had a plumbing project to do, Megan would just take them and leave the house for hours at a time. And truthfully, that was just better. So plumbing has never been my favorite thing to do. And there are any number of reasons. Because underneath the dark recesses of the sink, there are scary things. And one of the things that's underneath the sink is there is a valve that connects where the water line from the house connects to the water line to the sink. And if you've ever replaced a faucet, you know that apparently those little valves down there are completely decorative because if you actually turn it, it will never work again. So I found this out the hard time and I had to replace that. You know, I always have to go to Ace or Home Depot three times. And then beyond that, the valve itself where, they, where the two lines come together, there's not a washer in there. It's just kind of like this tension joint, which means that you have to get it really, really tight. And so I got a couple of wrenches and I am cranking on those as hard as I possibly can. And no matter how hard I get them, whenever I turn on the water, water everywhere. So thankfully, the children and Megan are not here during this time when this is happening. And I just cannot get this line to seal itself. So what do you do when you're having a prob uh, plumbing problem? Well, if you're me, you call Jim Bommel. So I get on the phone and I'm like, hey, Jimmy, I got a plumbing problem. And he's like, what's your plumbing problem? I'm like, well, basically water is spraying everywhere. He's like, you have a plumbing emergency. I'll come right over. So I tell him what to do. And uh, he goes up and he comes right back down and he goes, problem fixed. I'm like, what did you do? He's, I'm like, I got that as tight as I possibly could. And he brings out this wrench that is probably three feet long. And he holds it up and he goes, you just needed a little bit more leverage 
just needed a little more leverage. Sometimes, oftentimes, you just gotta have the right tools. Sometimes you need a little bit of help. And oftentimes in life, we have used the tools that we have and we need just a little bit more leverage. We need something bigger. We need more help than what we can do on our own. There's this verse in the middle of Zechariah that reminds us that we might not have all the tools that we need. We might not have the leverage that we need to get the job done, but God does. It's this verse that says, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Doesn't that sound like something that would be in the New Testament? I mean, Jesus, before departing, his disciples looks around them and gives them the great commission and says, not by might nor by power, but my, by my spirit, says the Lord. But it's not in the New Testament. It's actually in the Old Testament, which is one of the reasons why I think this minor prophets study is so fun, because a lot of the verses that we know are actually there. And we're like, hmm, I had no idea that was there. It feels like the New Testament. And actually, if you think that, you're not too far off. I mean, literally, we are into the second to the last book of the Old Testament. And while it will take the people who are living uh, in that time 500 years to get to the New Testament, we get there in just a couple of pages. But because of where we are in this sermon series and where the book is in the Bible, I want you to feel the movement. The movement not only of the book, but the movement of the Old Testament, which gets us to this point. So in a nutshell, we start way back in Genesis at the beginning. And God creates everything that is, and everything is perfect. People are in perfect relationship with each other. People are in perfect relationship to God. There's no war. There's no famine. There's no disease. There's none of those things. And it's just the way it's supposed to be. But we mess it up. And instead of just kind of flicking us off the face of the earth, God puts this plan of salvation into place, which is that he's going to redeem us back. And his whole plan is to get us where we originally started, back to where things were the way that they were supposed to be. And so he has this plan that involves the people of Israel. And he has a covenant with them. And that's what we've been studying, that he would be their God and they would be his people. But... And then through them, the entire world would be blessed, but they continue to mess it up. And so we're in, in this prophetic cycle of where God calls his people back and says that there's going to be consequences for not being faithful to the covenant, and there are. And as we studied, we, we talked a lot about the earlier prophets calling people to repentance, saying, you're going to be in trouble because God's going to use the Babylonians, and you're going to be hauled off to exile, and that's exactly what happens. But now, as we have moved through this cycle of God calling his people to repentance, threatening consequences, and always promising hope, we're back to the hope portion because the Babylonian exile is over now. And so in this last second to the last book of the Old Testament, Zechariah is actually far more about the judgment that is going to be on Israel's oppressors and what the future for God's people and what God intends it to look like. It's much more about that than it is around, about the original cycle of judgment. In Zechariah, the people are back from exile. God's restoring them. They're called to build the temple and they're looking forward to what's going to happen next. And we're being set up for the story that then is going to expand in the New Testament. And so when Zechariah, how does the story that we're gonna look at now fit in? And how will all of this happen? How will we get moved from the Old Testament into the New Testament, where God's plan of salvation is located no longer in Israel, but is located in Jesus? And then as we walk through the New Testament to the book of Revelation, where we're back to Genesis again, where everything is perfect. How is all of that going to happen? Well, the answer of the book of Zechariah is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And that is a great verse. But it isn't just this disembodied remark, because the beginning of that verse says, tell Zerubbabel this. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord, is an encouragement 
for a person. So why would God be so interested in saying this to Zerubbabel? Well, let's go back to Haggai for a second. And who is Zerubbabel and why is he important? Well, Zerubbabel is the governor that's been set up by the Persians who took over from the Babylonians. And Zerubbabel actually is a descendant of the royal line of David. So he comes from the royal house of Israel and he is now the governor and he has been given the job of building the temple. It's a call from God. That's what the book of Ezra and Nehemiah and Haggai and Zechariah are about. They've been given a job to rebuild the temple. And it is not always going to be easy. In fact, it might never be easy. But as Zerubbabel and his counterparts work on God's call in their life, God gives them this encouragement. It's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. It's almost like God is saying, I'll give you the tools you need to do the job. I will give you the extra leverage that you need so that you can accomplish this thing that I have called you to do. And we know from the books of Haggai and Zechariah and Ezra that Zerubbabel, by the power and the grace of God, does the work that God has for him. And what was the work? Well, it was rebuilding the temple, sure, but it goes deeper than that because it's something that is common to all of us who follow God, who follow Jesus now. Otherwise, if it was just about rebuilding the temple in 520 BC, the book would have no application. It would simply be a history lesson. So what is the work that God really has for Zerubbabel? Let's look at the passage out of Zechariah chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. And I got to tell you, in Zechariah, we have finally got to what a lot of people think about the minor prophets. It has finally gotten weird. Um, there is all sorts of visions and dreams. And if you read Zechariah, a lot of the time you'll be going, what in the world is going on? Chapter 4, verse 1. Then the angel who talked with me returned and woke me up. Like someone awakened from sleep, he asked me, what do you see? I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top and seven lamps on it with seven channels to the lamps. Also, there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on the left. There's a solid gold lampstand and there's a bowl at the top. There's seven lamps on it. And there's seven channels on the lamps and then there's olive trees and the olive trees have channels. See what I mean? Zechariah knows this is weird. Verse four, I asked the angel who talked to me, what are these? He answered, do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I replied. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. What are you, mighty mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become level ground. Then he will bring out the capstone to shouts of God bless it, God bless it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands will also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. Who dares despise the day of small things, since the seven eyes of the Lord that range throughout the earth will rejoice when they see the chosen capstone in the hand of Zerubbabel? Then I asked the angel, what are these two olive trees on the right and the left of the lampstand? Again, I asked him, what are these two olive branches beside the two gold pipes that pour out golden oil? He replied, do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I said. So he said, these are the two who are anointed to serve the Lord of all the earth. Well, that's about as clear as mud, isn't it? And see what I mean about being strange? But everything in there is important. And let me just cut to the chase. It's about the lampstand. It's about the lights. It's about the oil. It's about bringing the light of God into the world. And if you think about the light of God, that's a super New Testament theme, isn't it? But again, it's right here in the Old Testament. God is bringing his light among people. Isaiah picks up on that too. How does God's light shine though? Back to the lampstand. It's through his people because there's multiple different lights. It's about how God is lighting up the world and he's doing it 
through his people. And I love how this uh, verse starts. The angel woke me up and I was like someone awakened from sleep. In other words, I was pretty groggy. So if this seems a little bit strange, remember, <laughs> I was pretty groggy. So you got the lampstand and the olive trees. So there's seven bowls on the lampstand and then there are seven um, channels in each one for a total of 49. Now this is important. Seven times seven. Seven is the perfect number. And seven times seven is even more perfect than that. And so what Zechariah is signaling this, and it doesn't matter if you believe in numerology because they did, what, what Zechariah is saying that this is the perfect light that God is bringing to shine in the world. And then there's these olive trees. What do lamps and olive trees have to do with each other? Well, let me show you a lamp. So these pictures are, is a lamp from my collection. The lamp dates at least from the 8th century BC, somewhere between the 8th and the 10th century BC. And you can see the back of it is broken off, but the inside of it would hold oil. And from a couple of the different perspectives, you can see that the wick would have laid in the pinched end, and you can still see the burn marks from when this lamp was used almost 3,000 years ago. But in order for the lamp to stay lit, you have to continually put olive oil into it. If you don't continue to put olive oil into the lamp, it will sputter out as soon as the oil is gone, and it won't light anymore. The lamps have to have oil to stay lighted. They can only shine light while they have oil in them. And so you have these olive trees, one on the left on one on the right, and there are pipes connecting the olive trees to the lamps, and there is olive oil flowing through them because the light of God will constantly be fed by God himself. We know this from verse 11 and 12. And so if, if the light of God is God's people, one of the things that we can learn from this picture is we have to be tied into God. Otherwise, our light will sputter out fairly quickly. We're carrying the light of God, not just our own light. And that's important when we are out and about other people. And so the task that Zerubbabel has is building the temple, sure. But the purpose of the temple is to show the light of God. And basically what God is saying with this is, Zerubbabel, I will provide the tools you need. I will provide the oil for the lamp. I will provide the light. You don't have to manufacture the light yourself. So here's the word of encouragement. Zerubbabel, as you look at all of the challenges of this, I mean, how are you going to maintain the light? How are you going to build the temple? How are you going to overcome all the people that are telling you you can't do this? How can you overcome the challenges? The word of God says, tell Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So let's try this for just a second. Instead of the name Zerubbabel, what if you put your name in there? And what if you think about the challenges that you face? What if you think about the things that you believe God has called you to do? And what if you hear these words, tell Michael, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. What if you hear that? as you think about what you're called to do. And what are some of the things that you're called to do? Well, in, in many ways, a lot of us, most of us are called to the same things. We are called to fulfill our relationship responsibilities honorably. Whether it's a relationship with our spouse or our parents to our children or our friends, we're called to fulfill relational responsibilities. We're called to our work or whatever work is for you now. Um, because you may be retired, but hopefully while you're retired, God has given you something else that is really your work, because there's got to be some purpose for your life. So if you're not sure, what is the one thing that you feel like God is calling you to do right now? But work as a follower of Jesus 
is really a calling. We're called to our work. We're called to our relationships. We're called to our work. We're called to connect deeply with God and not set the core of this parable, really, that he's telling, is that unless we're connected deeply to God, our light will go out pretty quickly. I know also that as followers of Jesus, we're called to participate with God in God's plan to redeem the world by loving and caring for the people God brings across our path. And all of those things can be hard. Relationships can be hard. Work can be hard. Some days connecting to God can be hard. Some days loving our neighbors can be hard. You may think you can't do it. You'll, you'll get to the end of your patience. You'll get to the end of your giftedness. You won't have the right wrench. You'll get to the end of the money that you have for that project or that season. But those things are not ultimately what's going to accomplish the task before you, what's going to help you meet your calling. God says, it's going to be my spirit working in you. And maybe there are other challenges that are unique to you. I think those are common things that we all are called to. But what are some of the unique challenges you face? Many of you are in education and you're facing huge challenges with remote learning or some of you K-1 have kids that are actually in there, those of you who deal with, uh, with specialized populations. And you're trying to teach under really difficult circumstances because in addition to being a teacher, you're supposed to be an IT person to be able to help everybody with Zoom. And you're dealing with lots of parents and lots of students who are stressed and not always on their best behavior. And you may get up every morning and you feel like trying to teach kids is insurmountable. But not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And maybe you're one of those parents that feels like you are constantly, like, as about up to here. And you're juggling schoolwork, and you're juggling your kids' needs, and you're juggling what has to be done just to keep your family intact, and you're dealing with all the disappointments that you had, the things you had hoped for, what this time would look like, and you're like, I don't think I can go another day, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Maybe you've been isolated for months because of some underlying health condition or what have you, and you just miss people and you're like, I don't know if I can do this anymore. And you've been so good and now you've got this pandemic fatigue and you're like, I just have to be done with this. I can't anymore. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Maybe you're trying to juggle family needs um, on both ends of the spectrum. You're trying to be with them, it's trying to help them and it's just so challenging and you're like, I cannot answer the phone one more time to help. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. When we're talking about might, what that word really means is the resources that we have to bring to bear. It can be money, it can be talents, it can be any of those things. And power is just sheer physical power. And there are days when you just don't have the resources anymore. But it's not by your might. It's not by your resources. It's not by your sheer strength or physical strength. It's by God's spirit that you'll be able to endure these things. Maybe your challenge is different. What's the challenge you're facing? What is the thing that you feel like is causing you about to go under the water? Hear God's encouragement, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit and accept God's encouragement. It doesn't mean that you have to stop trying. You have to keep trying. It does mean that you can tap into a power source that is deeper than your own. It does mean you get a bigger wrench that gives you more leverage. Zerubbabel is lighting the world. We're called to light the world. So let's talk about that for a second because we're almost to the New Testament and light is a huge theme, particularly in the Gospels. Um, in John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus is the light of the world. But in Matthew, Jesus looks at his followers and says, you are the light of the world. 
A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And if you put them both together and don't mind mixing your metaphors a little bit, you get the vine and the branches. You get the olive trees. Because Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. And as long as you abide in me, you'll bear fruit. If we try and be our own light, it will go out. But if we are tied into God's light, he will provide the oil to keep the light going. Jesus is the light of the world. But when we are tied into Jesus, we become the light of the world. And that is the chief calling that we have to bring light to the world. There's a bigger purpose for you beyond whatever else you're doing. Are you living bigger than your life? Are you living into what God is doing? And we know that being the light of the world, we know that shining light in the darkness isn't without its challenges. In verse seven, you've got this strange verse. What are you, mighty mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become level ground. It's a further encouragement. You don't have the strength to be able to do this, and there will be mountains in your way, but not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And even those mountains, when you're tied into God, they will be like level ground. With God, you can do this. And sometimes it feels like we have so little to actually bring to the table. Sometimes it feels like we can't contribute much. And I think that's where the obscure saying in verse 10 comes in. Who dares despise the day of small things? How many of you have a nightlight? Either in your bedroom or in the bathroom or in the hallway. Do you know most nightlights have bulbs that are either four or seven watts? If you turn a nightlight on during the day, it makes no difference whatsoever. But you put a nightlight on at night, and it's amazing how bright four watts can be. In the darkness of the night, four watts provides plenty of light. In the darkness of the night, four watts is enough to, is enough to help you find your way. Or go outside. The stars at night are light years away. The nearest star, actually a pair of them, is 4.3 light years away. And yet in the darkness of the light, those small lights from so far away will help you find your way. Just a little bit of light makes a huge difference. It feels very dark out there. Part of it is it's November and it really is dark. But there's also just this existential darkness that we are living in because of the pandemic and the continuing partisan and the election, all those types of things. Megan and I actually put up some white lights. We have some very strong Christmas decorating opinions. I mean, we are definitely the day after Thanksgiving people and not before. But honestly, this year, we just needed a little bit more light. We needed to re be reminded that in the darkness, there is a light. And that's why God sends his people into the darkness to remind people that there is light. And that is the work of the church. And we get connected to the light when we get connected to Jesus. Speaking of Jesus, there's one more thing I want to bring out of the text. Verse 12, again I asked him, what are these two olive branches beside the two gold pipes that pour out gold and oil? He replied, do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I said. So he said, these are the two who are anointed to serve the Lord of all the earth. This could take a very long time. You're just gonna have to trust me on this. But the two olive trees, the two olive branches represent the priest and the king. Zerubbabel is the king and Jozadak is the priest and together they are accomplishing God's will. In Jesus, both of those things come together. Jesus is the priest in the order of Melchizedek and he's the king in the line of David. And they come together in one person. And he is the source of the light. He is what we need to be connected to in order to tie into his power. And so we tie in to Jesus by prayer. 
Sometimes I think prayer gets too difficult. Sometimes all prayer needs to be is, God help me today. Or God help me see what you're doing in my life and help me to participate in that. We get connected to the source of power by praying. We get connected by putting God's word inside of us because we are going to be formed by the thing that goes into us most. We get connected when we have positive relationships with friends who will encourage us and not discourage us and vice versa. We get connected to God when we engage with hope bringers. And hope bringers reminds me that this passage is fundamentally about God's invitation to live life bigger than our own lives. It's hard during this time. That's the reality of it. But I believe that this time is going to show you who you really are and what you're really made of. And so maybe join me in remembering this every day. Maybe when you wake up every morning, before you get out of bed, you say this, tell this to Michael. Well, you should insert your name there, although I'll be happy if you pray for me. Tell this to, insert your name there, as you get out of bed this morning, that whatever you encounter today, you will succeed, not by mind, nor by power, but by God's Spirit. So let me ask you three questions. In what ways are you currently connecting with God? Number two, how are you relying on your own resources to cope rather than on God's? And number three, what's one way you can bring the light of Jesus into someone else's life this week? We're just going to keep playing for a few seconds to let you think about those questions that Michael asked. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living home. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen.
experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of Harbor Covenant family, we have three exciting opportunities for you coming up in the next couple weeks. First of all, I just wanted to let you know that we are going to be doing an online Thanksgiving Eve service. That's going to take place on Wednesday, November 25th at 7 p.m. That will be on our online platform that we go to on Sunday at 8 30, 10, and 7 p.m., same place. And um, it's just going to be a, a time of putting our focus on Jesus and remembering all that we have to be thankful for. I think um, it'll be a really enriching time, and I encourage you to come to, come to that. Uh, it's going to be Wednesday the 25th, 7 p.m. The second opportunity that we have for you, Harbor Covenant family, is these awesome boxes that our children's ministry department has put together for our families. And so some of you might remember, for day camp, we had boxes similar to this that we picked up, and then we got to do day camp in a box online. And our children's team has been working hard to put these together for us. So the goodies that are inside are things for us to do um, a, an Advent candle lighting with our families, a weekly game, and a service project. And they will be available to sign up um, online for families to get this. It's one box per family. And Jessica, Matt, and Jeremy have been putting together videos that go alongside of this. And I think it's just going to be an awesome time for us to, to focus just in our individual family units, for those of us with kids, on how we can, how we can focus on Jesus and um, make the ex expecting his, his life and our families um, come to pass through some of the activities that are in here. So you can go ahead and find out more information at harborcove.church slash simply Christmas. And our third fun thing that we have going on is on... The 29th of November at 6 p.m., we are going to do our annual Advent kickoff. And I just love Advent kickoff. It's one of my favorite things that we do here at Harbor Covenant. It's a great multi-generational event. Um, young kids and teens and families and folks that are 60 plus just all get together. And we get to remember that Advent is here and celebrate Jesus together. This year, we're going to do it outdoors. There'll be some carols and a tree lighting and some service project opportunities. So um, just put that on your calendar, Sunday the 29th of November, 6 p.m., Advent kickoff. People of God, as we walk through this season of darkness, just like Zechariah is almost to the New Testament, we are almost to Advent, the season of light. And would you remember that you are a light bringer wherever you go? Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Amen.